Hi, this is Andrew Afarnas. Last year, uh, I had the pleasure to represent the AOH at the 2019 ANO conference in Bangkok in Thailand. And I had the opportunity of presenting a paper on the emergence of accelerated silicosis in the manufactured stone bench top industry. I'd like to go through that presentation for you so you can see what I did. In September 2018, health surveillance of workers cutting and polishing artificial stone bench tops in Queensland found that 12 of 35 workers from just two businesses had a severe and rapidly progressive type of silicosis known as accelerated silicosis. A follow-up audit of Queensland workplaces undertaken by the Queensland Government in late 2018 identified a further 98 workers with silicosis, 15 of which were found to be terminal. News of this epidemic quickly rose to the nation's attention with a number of media outlets reporting the health crisis facing workers cutting artificial stone kitchen bench tops and the awful plight of terminally ill Anthony White, who would sadly become the first stonemason to die of this terrible disease. He was only 36. Subsequent screening of 800 current and former Queensland workers confirmed a further 156 cases of silicosis in its various forms. Of these cases, over 20 were found to have progressive massive fibrosis, the rapidly progressive form of this disease, which leads to early death or lung transplantation. Further cases of the potentially deadly lung disease, silicosis, emerged in other Australian states and territories, including New South Wales, the ACT and Victoria, with a similar crude prevalence of the disease, suggesting that the cases first identified in Queensland were just the tip of the iceberg. As we speak, all other Australian state and territory governments are undertaking similar workplace audits and health screening of current and past workers to assess the magnitude of this epidemic. What is silicosis? Silicosis or fibrosis of the lungs is the oldest and best recognised of the pneumoconioses or dust diseases. It is an irreversible but preventable lung disease that is caused by the inhalation and deposition of respirable crystalline silica in the lung tissue. These silica particles trigger inflammation and fibrosis in the lungs, leading to progressive, irreversible and potentially disabling disease. Silica exposure is also associated with increased risk for lung infection, notably tuberculosis, lung cancer, emphysema, autoimmune diseases and kidney disease. Until recently, cases usually affected older men who had worked in dusty conditions before the implementation of the current occupational dust regulations. Individuals with silicosis gradually develop breathlessness on exercise and dry cough, which usually progresses gradually. However, symptoms are a late manifestation and many patients will not notice anything until severe disease is established. Cases can be detected earlier by workplace surveillance, specifically lung function and chest imaging, which is mandatory in most states, but is seldom actually done. If caught early enough and further exposure is prevented, silicosis only progresses slowly. Silicosis can be divided into three different types, acute, accelerated, and chronic. Acute silicosis is very rare and results from very short-term exposure to very large amounts of silica, typically less than one year, but can be as short as months or even weeks. Accelerated silicosis differs from the more typical chronic silicosis in three main ways. Firstly, the duration of occupational exposure to manufactured stone products in cases of accelerated silicosis are often significantly shorter than traditional silicosis. Historically, the majority of cases of silicosis diagnosed have been associated with periods of occupational exposure to silica in excess of 20 years. In contrast, workers with accelerated silicosis typically have less than 10 years of exposure to artificial stone products, with cases reported of as little as four years of exposure. Secondly, accelerated silicosis has a shorter latency period meaning workers are being diagnosed at a younger age. Traditionally, workers who contact, contract con chronic silicosis do not develop significant disability for 20 to 30 years following exposure to silica. In such instances, workers do not develop a disabling disease until late in their working lives or often when they're already in retirement. 
In contrast, workers in the manufactured stone industry who have developed accelerated silicosis on average tend to be in their 40s, although there have been many cases of workers diagnosed in their 20s and 30s. Finally, accelerated silicosis tends to progress faster than in other forms of silicosis, leading to a poorer prognosis. Chronic silicosis tends to progress very slowly over many years. In some cases, there can be no discernible progression for years. This means that most cases of chronic silicosis are not immediately fatal, with many patients living for years with only moderate impairment. Manufactured stone represents a bigger hazard to health than traditional products containing silica for two main reasons. Manufactured stone is a man-made product consisting of a very high level of silica, much higher levels than marble or granite, the traditional products previously used in the construction industry. Manufactured stone bench tops can contain over 90% crystalline silica. Granite, for example, typically contains 30%, while certain varieties of marble, such as calcite, dolomite, and onyx, may contain little or no silica. Secondly, cutting artificial stone creates much more respirable silica dust than traditional products. Manufactured stone is created by finely grinding quartz and then suspending it in a resin. When the manufactured stone is cut, the finely ground quartz easily becomes airborne, exposing workers to very fine respirable silica dust. As a result, high levels of respirable silica are liberated during sizing, fitting, and polishing of bench tops that can be inhaled by workers, posing a far greater risk to health compared to undertaking similar activities with natural stone products. For these reasons, the biggest threat of exposure is to the factory workers who manufacture the product, the stone masons who cut and install it, as well as any others working in the vicinity of these activities. Silicosis is one of the oldest and most studied occupational diseases in Australia. Effective regulation of high-risk industries has occurred since the 1920s. Traditionally, workers diagnosed with silicosis in Australia have worked in the mining and quarrying, excavation and tunnelling, brickwork, stone masonry and foundry industries. Improvements in occupational health and hygiene, as well as the decline in the size of many of these industries in Australia, has meant that rates of silicosis have plummeted throughout the second half of the 20th century suggesting that the disease could eventually be eliminated as a workplace hazard in Australia. The emergence of cases of accelerated silicosis in Australia can be linked to the growth in popularity of manufactured or engineered stone products. It has also been exacerbated by the recent boom in the housing construction industry. Manufactured stone is a composite material which was introduced to the Australian marketplace in the early 2000s. Since then, manufactured stone has become the most popular material used for kitchen, bathroom and laundry bench tops, displacing traditional materials such as granite, marble and timber, as they are relatively cheap, durable and attractive. With increasing market demand, the artificial stone industry has rapidly expanded, particularly over the past decade. Many new companies have been set up to deal with this demand in an industry that, in general, has a reputation for poor compliance with regulatory requirements. Audits of workplaces and the fabrication of manufactured stone products in Queensland identified 138 businesses undertaking such activities. As a result of these audits, 552 notices were issued with inadequate workplace cleaning practices and uncontrolled dry cutting practices attracting the most prohibition notices. And inadequate workplace cleaning practices, RPE issues and the failure to provide health monitoring attracted the most improvement notices. Inadequate cleaning practices captures a range of issues, such as the use of pressurised air or dry sweeping of dust containing silica that creates secondary exposure to risk or crystalline silica risks to workers, through to poor cleaning regimes at a workplace that allow dust to accumulate in work areas. RPE issues include the provision, maintenance and fit testing of RPE. This comprehensive workplace order undertaken by Workplace Health and Safety Queensland established that the stone bench top fabrication industry is immature in its understanding of the health risk posed by exposure to RCS and the control measures necessary to minimise worker exposure. The Queensland Government has recommended that a follow-up campaign across a sample of businesses audited should be performed to monitor ongoing compliance, in particular with regard to health monitoring obligations. Further ongoing workplace characterisation by other state and territory government agencies is currently being undertaken. 
For those states that have characterised the businesses working in the manufactured stone industry, the number of workers potentially exposed to RCS in the manufactured stone industry is likely to be in the thousands. Given the prevalence of silicosis, 20%, and progressive massive fibrosis, 2.5%, and the average number of workers identified in Queensland workplaces, this would potentially equate to over 700 workers being diagnosed with silicosis and almost 100 with PMF. It should be noted that these estimates do not include manufactured stone businesses in Tasmania, the ACT or Northern Territory. So how did this well-known occupational hazard re-emerge unnoticed? What makes the consequences of the emergence of silicosis in the manufactured stone benchtop industry even more heartbreaking is the fact that not only young men in their 30s, the youngest to date is aged 21 years, are being affected, but this is a huge impact on the lives of their young families, their wives, their children, that will feel the impact of silicosis for the rest of their lives. The AOH defines occupational hygiene as the art and science dedicated to the anticipation, recognition, evaluation, communication and control of environmental hazards in or arising from the workplace that can result in injury, illness, impairment or affect the well-being of workers and members of the community. Despite the causes of silicosis and the methods of prevention having been well known for at least 70 years, why wasn't the potential emergence of accelerated silicosis in the manufactured stone bench top industry anticipated? High RCS exposures and associated cases of silicosis in the manufactured stone industry have been described in countries such as Spain, Israel and Italy. All of these studies flag the importance of the identification of workers exposed to high levels of RCS due to the use of artificial stone products and the likelihood of many other cases of silicosis worldwide likely to occur due to the increasing popularity of this product and the apparent lack of preventative measures being used. The first case in Australia was recognised in 2016 and published in the Medical Journal of Australia by Marta et al and reported to regulators by concerned physicians. If cases of accelerated silicosis were already identified in Spain, Italy and Israel, as well as flagged in Australia, why wasn't this warning heeded? Why wasn't this potential risk anticipated in a country like Australia? Firstly, the manufactured stone industry is a relatively new industry where there's been little or no appreciation awareness of the potential health risks associated with breathing in RCS let alone working with manufactured materials with very high levels, levels of silica. It is an industry dominated by small to very small businesses, in many cases, family owned and run. Traditionally, certified stonemasons were engaged to install natural stone bench tops. However, most of this work is now being done by other trades that happen to end up doing the work rather than certified stonemasons. Although those might introduce inefficiency, efficiencies at some level of the system, it also leads to a loss of professional identity, complex skills, and the often intuitive understanding of safety issues that emerges through deep experience with the trade. Even as suppliers of manufactured stone products had GHS compliant safety data sheets detailing the potential health risks and the associated controls required to mitigate RCS exposure, users were either not supplied with these SDSs or they were not read. Health and safety information contained within the SDS will likely not to have been passed on to the actual individuals employed to cut and polish the manufactured stone. In most cases, the manufactured stone did not come with warning labels on them. Communication of the risks associated with these manufactured stone products would also have been further compounded by the fact that many people working in this industry are from non-English speaking backgrounds. Even if small businesses wanted to work safely, due to the heavy competition within the housing construction industry and low profit margins mean that many small businesses cannot afford to implement the appropriate engineering control strategies. Further compounding such financial pressures, many small businesses face significant pressure from large construction companies to maintain challenging deadlines. They often feel strong pressure to take the job and rush through a high number of jobs. They are in no position to turn down jobs or negotiate about the conditions in which they take place. That's when small businesses are likely to cut corners, particularly with respect to safety and quality. Because so many different people can now install bench tops, there is a reluctance to say no to jobs, even when conditions are less than optimal. 
Unlike large companies that have either the internal specialist capability, such as a certified occupational hygienist, or the budget to engage external occupational hygienists to undertake comprehensive risk assessments to characterise possible workplace exposure hazards and identify the appropriate controls necessary to control exposure, small businesses do not have the internal capability or budget to engage a certified occupational hygienist. As already mentioned, this industry has evolved into many small and family run businesses with very limited knowledge of regulatory requirements regarding safe levels of silica exposure. Small companies by definition have limited budget and resources to conform to any regulations. Moreover, many artificial stone workers are subcontractors in the building and construction industry and may have little or no training regarding health issues or safe work practices. There is no formal oversight of health issues and the responsibilities placed on individual contractors. As a result, for the most part, these risks remain unidentified in the majority of these small businesses. In recent times, Australia has moved to a risk-based legislation with minimal guidance, codes of practice or other tools to either assist small businesses understand how to manage specific hazardous substances and enable straightforward enforcement by state work, health and safety regulatory authorities. With ever increasing pressure to reduce budget, state and territory governments have significantly reduced the numbers of health and safety inspectors and technical experts, such as certified occupational hygienists, such that there's now a lack of experienced persons in WHS regulatory departments to enforce hazardous substances legislation. Unlike the requirements to notify the health and safety regulator of an exceedance of criteria for asbestos and air monitoring, there are no legislative requirements to notify any WHS regulatory authority of an exceedance of any other exposure standard, such as respiratory crystalline silica. If such notification requirements were in place, then regulators would be equipped with the knowledge of where silica dust and air exceedances were occurring and could take a risk approach to enforcement. So what needs to be done to address this epidemic? Firstly, and most importantly, improved education is needed for workers and employees who are legally responsible for the consequences of poor dust control. We need to educate at-risk workers with targeted awareness and education initiatives, not just in English, but in other languages. There needs to be a greater onus on the principal construction company responsible for the construction site. They need to ensure that all those working on site including subcontractors are aware and familiar with all workplace risks, and they are all trained in the effective use of controls, particularly respiratory protection. Construction companies should not only have documented safe systems of work and appropriate risk assessments completed for all worksite hazards that detail the necessary controls to be implemented in the workplace, but also have a comprehensive contractor management system and induction process that ensures that all contractors and subcontractors working on site have been appropriately inducted and trained on the potential hazards they could be exposed to on site. This induction should outline the key requirements of their respiratory protection program, specifically respiratory fit testing training, and the need to be clean shaven when using respiratory protection. Better education regarding the hazards of silica inhalation and of diagnosing occupational lung disorders is also needed for both primary and secondary care doctors. The loss of awareness of occupational lung disease by both regulatory bodies and by medical professions, professionals need to be reversed. All workers currently involved in the manufacture of kitchen bench tops need to be identified, screened and placed on a periodic ongoing health screening program, firstly to diagnose any cases of existing silicosis, as well as to identify any changes in lung function going forward to prevent onset of disease in the future. In particular, there is an increased risk of developing and spreading tuberculosis for workers from migrant community, communities and cases, cases should be sought in the tuberculosis clinics as TB can mask underlying silicotic nodules. A centralised national health surveillance scheme for workers in high risk sectors such as construction, demolition and tunnelling for example should be set up. Such a scheme will help us understand the true extent of silicosis in the Australian workplace environment allowing us to analyse trends in disease that may in turn inform future policy or specific action. The uncontrolled dry cutting of manufactured stone products must be banned immediately. Generation of RCS during uncontrolled dry cutting can result in worker exposures tens of times higher than the current workplace exposure standard. 
Dry cutting of artificial stone products can, re can result in workers being exposed to levels of respiratory crystalline silicon in excess, in excess of 44 milligrams per cubic metre over a 30 minute sampling period. Queensland has already banned this activity and other states and territories are likely to follow. Dry cutting can be controlled using either water suppression or local exhaust extraction attached to power tools. Water suppression uses water at the point of dust generation to dampen down or suppress dust before it is released into the air. Water suppression is the most common form of dust control in the stone bench top industry. Powered hand tools such as grinders or polishers and large machinery, including bridge saws, routers or polishing machines fitted with water feeds are available for manufacturers and retailers in Australia. Wireless wet blade cutting of artificial stone products is associated with a vastly improved dust standard, 4.9 milligrams per meter cubed over a 30 minute sampling period. This level of exposure still poses a risk to health, albeit lower than that associated with dry cutting. Research would indicate that best practice involves wet blade cutting in combination with local exhaust ventilation, which is shown to reduce respiratory crystalline silica exposure to as little as 0.6 milligrams per meter cube over a 30 minute sampling period. Local exhaust ventilation is used to remove airborne contaminants before they reach the breathing zone of workers. It is the most effective control for large quantities of respiratory crystalline silica dust, dry or wet, as it is applied close to the source of generation. Local exhaust ventilation systems include a shroud, a suction casing that surrounds the wheel of stone, an on-tool hose attachment and a vacuum system. The dust or mist is collected within the shroud, drawn into the hose attachment to the vacuum where it is filtered and discharged. Utilisation of water suppression means that cutting usually has to take place in a workshop environment rather than on site. These precautions will add to the cost of doing business, meaning they are unlikely to be popular with business owners. We prioritise the health of employees over these concerns. The current epidemic of silicosis within this industry clearly shows us that we cannot rely on any industry alone to regulate health and safety risk. We need government regulators appropriately equipped with inspectors and certified occupational hygienists to undertake assurance audits and random workplace visits. We need to ensure that companies, businesses and workplaces that do not comply with these regulatory requirements are adequately punished. We should also be considering implementing mandatory notification requirements, specifically notification to the state or territory WHS regulator in all cases where the shift adjusted workplace exposure standard is or has been exceeded for RCS. If such notification requirements are in place, then state WHS regulators would be equipped with the knowledge of where silicon dust in air exceedances were occurring and could take a risk-based approach to enforcement. The National Exposure Notification Register would have alerted state and territory WHS regulators of this issue at the time of exposure, thereby enabling intervention to prevent the onset of such disease. Notification to the state WHS regulator by the treating medical practitioner of silica-related disease across all industries. A centralised disease registry with branches in every state is needed, similar to those already exist for several cancers such as lung cancer and mesothelioma, and will require dedicated sustained funding. Ideally, this should be supported by a rapid response unit for investigating outbreaks of occupational respiratory disease. There have been some stakeholders who believe that a lower workplace exposure standard for RCS would have averted this epidemic of accelerated silicosis. As a result of this belief, there's been significant pressure from some worker unions to lower the RCS workplace exposure standard. Let me make it clear, the increased rates of accelerated silicosis in Australia are not related to the level of the current workplace exposure standard for RCS. The reality is the cases of acute silicosis are due to non-compliance with our existing exposure standards due to decades of no enforcement. Compliance with current workplace exposure standards will certainly stop any future occurrences of accelerated silicosis. It should be noted that lowering of the WES is pointless if people aren't aware of legislative requirements or if you don't have an external body such as a regulator policing these requirements. Changing a number on a piece of paper doesn't protect workers. Laws without enforcement are merely a deterrent. They don't protect workers from workplace exposures. Regulatory agencies could set a maximum permissible level of silicon manufactured products. 
However, as Australian market is only a tiny share of the world market, it would be unlikely that foreign manufacturers of manufactured stone would conform to such a requirement unless there was a worldwide commitment for the development of a maximum permissible level. Caution should also be taken to not install a false sense of safety. Mandating a maximum permissible level of silica in a product may significantly reduce incidence of accelerated silicosis. However, it would not protect workers from developing chronic silicosis. Just as the case with working with natural stone that has lower levels of silica, if you don't implement effective exposure controls, you will still get silicosis, just not as quickly. At present, the current focus is on the manufactured stone industry. However, silicosis is an issue in other industries. We need to ensure that we implement robust policy and legislation to protect workers in all industries where exposures to RCS can occur, for example, quarrying and tunnelling industries. As such, simple approaches that only apply to the manufactured stone industry, such as banning manufactured stone, will not address the risk in other industries. Such an approach would be like putting a Band-Aid on a broken leg. Looks good in a photo, does nothing to actually fix the issue. The Australian Institute of Occupational Hygienists have heavily consulted with state and federal governments. Specifically, with the New South Wales Government in the 2019 review of the New South Wales Dust Disease Scheme, which focused on the response to silicosis in the manufactured stone industry in New South Wales. With the Federal Government's establishment of a National Dust Disease Task Force to develop a national approach for the prevention, early identification, control and management of dust disease in Australia. In both cases, the AOH wrote a submission on behalf of its members detailing our position not only on the current crisis within the manufactured stone benchtop industry, but also across all workplaces where there is potential exposure to RCS. AOH members also participated in various, various stakeholder consultation forums undertaken on behalf of the task force around Australia. Key messages that were submitted by the AOH were as follows the importance of education and awareness of workers on health risks associated with RCS and other dust-related diseases, effective controls necessary to mitigate exposure, correct use and maintenance of respiratory protection. A consistent national approach must be taken with implementation of both a national health surveillance program and a national dust disease registry. And adequately resource and fund state and territory health and safety departments to allow them to proactively enforce health and safety regulations. The AOH has also advocated the employment and engagement of certified occupational hygienists by both federal and state governments and industry. At present, here are no mandated minimum levels of competency for occupational hygienists in legislation. The term occupational hygienist is not protected by law, meaning that the term can be used by anyone. In the context of the complexities of the construction environment, a full or fellow member of the Australian Institute of Occupational Hygienists with experience in the hazards to be assessed would be seen as the minimum necessary competency requirements in this high risk sector. Notwithstanding, this is not always applied and some contractors engage occupational hygienists in good faith and are provide inaccurate information on the degree of health risks. The AOH acknowledges that the only way to prevent further cases of accelerated silicosis is to control exposures. Key to achieving this is to promote awareness of this risk, specifically around the education, prevention and control. Most important, how to do something about it. As a result, the AOH has developed Breathe Freely Australia. Breathe Freely was a concept and campaign initially developed by the British Occupational Hygiene Society who were kind enough to give the AOH permission to use the many resources already developed by BOHS and slightly modify them to put them into the Australian context. This website is aimed at promoting hazard awareness and exposure control to prevent disease. It contains easy to read web-based resources for the construction, welding, manufactured stone and mining industries. Resources include toolboxes, checklists, industry and trade fact sheets, case studies, and examples of best practice. Breathe Freely Australia has been presented as three dedicated mining roadshows in Queensland as part of the Queensland OIR Silica Code of Practice rollout seminars and as part of the HIA Silica seminars in most states. To date, we have run or participated in over 20 seminars, reaching over 1,000 health and safety professionals, managers, supervisors, and tradespeople. 
The program will continue in November with three WA roadshows and presentations at the New South Wales Silica Seminar and the Queensland Healthy Lungs Forum. The Breathe Freely Australia program has raised the profile of the AIH and allowed us to engage with industries and workers that we have never engaged with before, particularly the building and construction industry, and most importantly, tradespeople. 